if we look around in the world, many people have the feeling we live in times which were never so interesting as they are today. The Munich Security Conference, this is the annual gathering of a lot of analysts, experts, security area, they counted a noticeable increase in political instability. Six or seven major wars uh, last year, over a hundred violent clashes across borders, inside countries, government crises, etc. So we can say this noticeable increase in political instability, this is not something which just happened in the last couple of months. Even before the latest crisis in Ukraine and Syria, we've seen it, for instance, uh, uh, there are and have been a uh, increase in Salafist terrorist risk, higher incidence of mass process government crisis in developed and developing countries. Now, most analysts like myself are used to treating each incident as idiosyncratic and contained. But the big question is, is there something systemic going on? The journalist Roger Cohn, whom you read from time to time in the New York Times, called the current period the great unraveling. And I think he's right to a certain degree. We can usually identify these turning points in foreign and security policy, these crises only after they have occurred, but several major trends and transformations make the international order today messier, make them more complicated than it has been in recent history. And very importantly, many of these risks are interrelated in ways that we barely begin to understand. And what I would like to do, to look together with you at some of the underlying factors. First, the geopolitical order is changing. Most established powers are busy with internal challenges and with cleaning up after the economic and financial crisis. Meanwhile, emerging powers push boundaries to test their new strengths. BRICS, Iran, Turkey, to name but a few. The United States is gridlocked internally and it's increasingly questioning its role in the world. And the EU, on the other side of the Atlantic, does not seem willing or able to take over more international responsibility. The second, the second trend is the system of global governance itself is under strain. We have moved from a US-dominated world to a multipolar one and some analysts even see a global power vacuum and call it the G0 world. The rising number of relevant actors and potential spoilers makes it even less likely that the community of states can act collectively. At the same time, the country's ability to solve problems on their own is weakening. And this leaves the world with a huge gap a gap between demand for and supply of international governance. The inability to find coordinated solutions in turn exacerbates broader risks, for example, risks stemming from climate change, cybercrime, migration, or the unraveling of multilateral trade and finance regimes. And the third trend, the nature of conflict is changing. State-to-state -state conflict is rare. Instead, we see a growing incidence of irregular and inner state strife, and that very weak or failed states can be as big a threat as rising great powers. Technology has changed the nature of conflict, and what we see is now described as so-called hybrid warfare. States and other actors do not only use guns and tanks, but drones, social media, cyber attacks. And finally, we see regional orders collapsing or at high risk. War has returned to Europe as Russia is challenging the post-Cold War order. In the Middle East, borders which were drawn 100 years ago are under threat 
and in Asia, China is pushing boundaries in its neighborhood. <coughs> and very recently, North Korea is putting not just its immediate neighborhood at risk, but it had all the ingredients of a major war, perhaps even a nuclear war. Now, predicting and preventing crises is getting harder and harder. Our ability to predict major crises, let alone to prevent them, appears to be weakening. Let me go back three years. In 2014, for example, with the exception uh, of some in Eastern Europe, nobody or very few people could have imagined how serious the Russia-Ukraine conflict would get. <coughs> Again, in 2014, it is astonishing that the rise of Daesh or IS came as a surprise even after they had controlled Fallujah and other regions of Iraq for months. And this raises the big question, what are we missing right now? The reason for this lack of foresight and imagination is not that we lack good analysts or good data. I think the world's think tanks and research institutions are full of smart, of well-informed people. However, the more complex and complicated the world gets, the harder it is to get it right. Moreover, the world of politics seems to suffer from a kind of attention deficit. The portfolios of foreign ministries of national security institutions are so full and the amount of potentially relevant information so vast that they are more likely to overlook or misjudge the signals amidst the static, amidst the noise. And for political leaders today, it is much more difficult to focus on one or two critical items which they would need to do to respond to each issue effectively. Now let us look at some of the most pressing issues in world politics. First, Russia-Ukraine. The conflict between Russia and Ukraine is probably the most dangerous crisis for European stability in years. Russia is a big nuclear power. It is highly integrated into the world economy and it is the world's largest gas exporter and also responsible for 12% of global oil experts. There is a risk that the Minsk Peace Accord will unravel and the recent proposals by Putin two, two weeks ago to put in UN peacekeepers I think should not be rejected out of hand even though the way he framed it to have them as sort of bodyguards for the OSCE observers and to inject Russian peacekeeping groups, of course, is a, is a no-no, but I think it would be worse to enlarge on it because the stalemate of Minsk means that Kiev says we cannot run an effective election campaign in the Donetsk because our people are not secure. On the other hand, the Russians or the little green men say we cannot withdraw heavy weaponry because they, the Kiev, does not do effective elections. Now. The Ukraine-Russia conflict also has systemic implications. It is not only a bilateral conflict, it is also and perhaps primarily the result of an aggrieved former superpower trying to test the resolve of the transatlantic alliance. And I believe the West now needs to pursue a double-track strategy. Sounds familiar, like Armel, but anyway. On the one hand, it needs to maintain a cohesive and firm stance vis-à-vis -vis Russia and, very importantly, provide more support to reforms in Ukraine. And on the other hand, the West needs to cooperate with Russia wherever possible to prevent a further isolation and radicalization there. But there are limits to what we can do as long as Vladimir Putin believes he can get away with invading a neighboring country. The outlook for stability in Europe remains, remains highly uncertain. In the long run, Russia will likely return to cooperation. It has little choice, 
given its dire economic and demographic situation and its dependence on selling raw material to the rest of the world. But in the meantime, Russia should be able to sustain its adversarial course for quite some time, since it has large foreign exchange reserves and a population that can take a lot of strain. The most likely outcome is another frozen conflict and a prolonged period of no trust or tensions between Russia and the West. And further escalation is a non legitimate risk. Second crisis point in our neighborhood, in the European neighborhood, Syria, Iraq, Turkey. Again, the mess in Syria and Iraq is not a local breakdown of order. It is a combination of failures at three levels. The international system is failing the region. The US used to guarantee stability in the region, but it now wants only a remote and minimal role. Although 70% of Middle Eastern oil goes to Asia, China does not play a security role in the Middle East. Regional powers are failing to bring stability, and on the contrary, the regional rivalry between three coalitions, Iran, Iraq, Assad, recently joined by Russia, versus Saudi, the Emirates, Bahrain, versus Turkey, Muslim Brothers, Qatar. This rivalry between the three coalitions is visible in every conflict from Yemen to Egypt. And these regional rivalries are also stalking the region's sectarian conflicts. Individual states in the regions are also failing. Many are now only hollow shells. This has created room for the rise of various militias. And these groups do not only fight, but they train people, produce and sell oil, provide social services, and give the people in the region a sense of local belonging. And in addition, there are long-standing ethnic and confessional fault lines. ISIS, Daesh, is just one manifestation of the politicization of Sunnis. And even though it is almost defeated in Syria and Iraq, it sends its tentacles overseas, Libya, Nigeria, and a number of terrorist groups in Europe. Now, what we see now is already a full-fledged war of proxy between Shia, under the leadership in Iran, and on the other hand, Saudi Arabia and Turkey. If you sit in Iran, what you have is managed to do to establish is a crescent from Hezbollah in Lebanon to the Alawites in Syria, the Shia majority in Iraq, the Shia theocracy in Iran, and the Hazara in Pakistan. And on the other hand, you have a pretty diverse group of countries where the Turkish role gets more and more, I would say, ambivalent, but it's mainly it's Saudi Arabia which is financing most of the uh, even violent um, um, Sunni groups. Now, the systemic implications. Since this is not a local conflict, a broader solution should be required. The US and Iran would have to come to an agreement so Iran gets interested in maintaining and not challenging the regional order. There would have to be a detente between Iran and Saudi Arabia and some sort of regional security architecture. The grievances of the Sunnis in Iraq and Syria would have to be addressed and that would require new ideas and how to share and how to institutionalize power. The states in the regions would have to be reorganized into loser federal entities so that local government can be more responsive and serve as a proxy for tribes, sects, militias. It is highly unlikely that all these factors will come together. In the near term, there is no positive scenario for the region. The best we can expect is containing the conflict, and in the long term, we need much more strategic patience. Now let me come to Asia-Pacific. 
the risk of an armed conflict in the East or South China Sea remains low, but not negligible. Its impact would be huge. The state of play is precarious. China has a large number of border disputes from the Himalayas to the Nine Dash Line in the East China Sea. The South China Sea is not only a critical byway for trillions of dollars in trade, there are likely to be enormous oil and gas reserves under a seabed. China's neighbors are concerned about China's growing assertiveness and are seeking closer ties with the US. Both China and Japan are run by more assertive, more nationalist leaders. And in the region, more generally, many historic grievances have yet to be dealt with. What are the systemic implications? The fundamental setup in Asia-Pacific would seem very prone to conflict. China is a rising, economically strong regional power. Because it is an authoritarian state, it might be tempted to use external enemies to distract attention from domestic failures. China's neighbors are relatively much weaker. So it might be that China will be tempted to challenge the predominance of the US as a Pacific power. And I have not spoken yet about the newly arising danger from North Korea. Now, North Korea, in my view, is not the strategic adversary of the United States. North Korea is a mosquito, but this mosquito can bring you death, like dengue, malaria, and others. And a great American president ages ago said if you deal with a determined enemy, what you need is to speak softly and carry a big stick. If you speak loudly and carry a small stick, this does not do the job. The window of opportunity, or the window where you could solve this issue militarily, has probably closed. And as Kim Jong-il, in my view, is not a total madman, he's very rational, he knows exactly the discussion in the West, what sort of casualties we are prepared to take, and he has seen the example of Pakistan, India, and perhaps to a certain degree Israel, to know once you are in possession of an effective intercontinental nuclear weapon, you cannot politically be pushed around. So what is the solution? I think it would be good if we could come back to the six party talks and there's only one power who can really be helpful, and that is China. Now, why doesn't China do more in arm twisting of North Korea? They could do it. They will not do it for the immediate future because they are afraid if North Korea implodes of the millions of refugees on the one hand, and afraid of the fact that if North Korea implodes, they will have a hot front line with American troops in South Korea. So what can be done? I think sanctions, pinpointed sanctions, could be helpful to bring them back to the table. Some sort of sea blockade might work, but as what is much more important are the so-called back channels. And here I would like to draw a parallel. Parallels are always not the right thing, but I uh, happened in my former job to negotiate the first three Iran uh, sanction resolutions. And it worked in Iran after a long, long time and with certain success. Meaning, if you respect the ability of a country as a potential superpower, a potential, not, I would not say a superpower, a potential nuclear power, and at the same time show them a way out of uh, isolation, which they need in order for the system to survive, it might be, it might be that would helpful. Certainly, it's certainly worth a try. Now, I dwelt on some of these aspects of this world out of joint before I come to my next point, namely the question 
what does our instrumentarium, our toolbox look like? How can we bring order into this unraveling world? The institutions we have, the international institutions, are all Western inventions. Of course, there are non-Western groupings, institutions, um, clubs, etc. But so far, they have not been very effective. What is the West, by the way? The West is not geographical. The West, how I would see it, is a normative project on the basis of the achievements of the American French Revolution, of the Declaration of Human Rights, of the Wilsonian principles of the Charter at Paris and all of the above. And these institutions we have really become brittle and become toothless if we lose this basis, if we lose this joint willingness, or if you want so, in the words of Joe Nye, this soft power, the attractiveness of our civilizational model. Let's look at the UN. The UN in recent years is more often blocked by a veto in a Security Council or threat of the veto than throughout the whole of the Cold War. So it seems that on many issues it cannot act. Why not then use the so-called G-groups? The G7, which was created for economic reasons by Schmidt and Giscard, the G20, which was established after the financial crisis, because there you have the people who can really make a dip the difference sitting together. You don't need a big structure, this all speaks for them. But they have one major disadvantage, and that is their lack of legitimacy. And we have seen in Iraq that legitimacy, which can only on a global scale be bestowed by the UN, is very, very important to get allies, to win friends, and to keep them. And by the way, for us living in democratic societies, legitimacy is very important because we don't want to be ruled by governments whose actions are considered not legitimate. So what to do by the, by the UN? The UN is a work in progress. Of course, it has to be reformed. The discussion goes on for decades. And I think what is absolutely necessary is the reform of the Security Council because one of the shortcomings is that it is representative of the world after the Second World War and not of the world of today. India, with 1.3 billion people, is not represented. The whole continent of Africa is not represented. Latin America is not represented. And we already have two and a half Europeans, Britain, France, and I count Russia as a half European. So it's quite clear that the authority of the uh, UN Security Council is challenged. Now, will there be a reform? And I spent many nights, many evenings of my precious lifetime negotiating on this, and I always said there will be re a reform, but it's probably like the return of the Messiah. It will happen, <laughs> but probably not in my lifetime. Let's go then to the other institutions of the West, to the European Union, European integration process, and NATO. I think it was the historic achievement of two people who were at the beginning of that. On this side, it was Truman and Marshall. And on the other side, in Europe, it was mainly Adenauer. Because Adenauer, against stiff public opinion resentment, forced Germany into integration of the West. Germany was not a Western country until then. The West was civilization. Germany had culture. If you read Heidegger, Sombart, even Thomas Mann, they all made the point, we are different. The Western civilization, Heidegger called it das Gestell, is superficial. And I'm making this point because that is exactly what Putin is trying to play on. He said, Ruski mir, the deep feeling for Heimat, for your country, the respect for religion and the church. All these things play a major role and played an even bigger role in the generation of my parents. And for Arno, it was a great achievement that he said, whatever Stalin wrote to, uh, to us in the famous Stalin note, 
if you are neutral, then we can talk about purification. He rejected that out of hand, and that was a great achievement. Now, the, uh, uh, um, we could have this period of 70 years of peace, stability, and prosperity in Europe because we could develop under the umbrella of the American nuclear assurance of Article 5 of NATO. Within Europe, I think the main thing was at the time to put the German question to rest. What is the German question? Germany, in the words of the historian De Hio, always was too big to be good neighbor and too small to be good hegemon. So, coming together, especially Germany and France, the two arch enemies, the Erbfeinde, and then creating a community of coal and steel to make sure that you cannot wage war as was at the beginning. No, there was one step after the other, the peace narrative, then the prosperity narrative, but if I talk to my children today, and they are in their 30s, they would say, I mean, come on, we won't go to war against France anyway, and uh, we have never felt any need, any uh, 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 the, 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 the promise of prosperity for us is fulfilled. However, immediately after the moment of the end of history, which was a very brief moment, <laughs> the war broke out in Yugoslavia, succession wars. We have now a hot war and the threat of war at our eastern borders. As far as the prosperity promise is concerned, ask the young generation in the south of Europe, where you have 50% unemployment. We in the north doing quite well. So this promise and the latest stage of economic integration was the common currency, the euro, did not do the job. As far as NATO is concerned, after the fall of the Iron Curtain, we asked ourselves, do we really need a military alliance against an enemy which does not exist anymore? And especially in this country, the very legitimate question came up to say, look, we are forking out more than half the cost for the common security and these Europeans, and some of them doing very well, are not paying up, they are free riders. And this is not an invention of President Trump. If you remember and read very carefully the interview of President Obama with the Atlantic Monthly, he said the same thing, only in a little bit more polite, polite words. <laughs> So, this means that we Europeans have to, certain, to a certain degree, take the fate into our own hands. When Angela Merkel came back from the G7 uh, uh, summit in Taormina and from the NATO summit in Brussels, she said, the time that we could totally rely on others are over. We have to take the fate into our own hands. People like myself immediately asked herself, have we gone completely crazy? Are we megalomaniac? No. Of course, we need NATO also in the future as our lifeline. But we have to do much, much more for our common security. And I'm not just talking of the 2%. You know, the 2% is only one aspect. The Belgians, for instance, increased the pensions of their officers to meet the 2%. The Greeks have a huge tank army, three times as big as Germany. These are all German tanks, which they bought on credit from us, so they meet the 2%. <laughs> now, what is much more important is a combination of diplomacy, development cooperation, and military. And my, my friend and uh, uh, crewmate, Wolfgang Ischinger, made a proposal three years ago. Why don't we all commit ourselves to a 3%, which includes the military, development aid and humanitarian aid, and it seems to be picking up a little bit. Now, I don't want to go too much into the details here. We can do it in the Q&A. The same goes for the Euro. Let me just, you, 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 you stop me, yeah? <laughs> let, me, let me just uh, spend a couple of minutes on the German elections, on Brexit and on Macron. The German elections are a watershed. A watershed in the sense that for the first time in our post-war history, we have a rabid, populist, 
right-wing party in Parliament with 13 degrees. Our European neighbors would say, so big deal. Yeah. We lived with that for a long time. In Germany, it is a big deal for obvious <coughs> reasons. These, the people who voted for this are not rabid Nazis. Some of them, some of the leadership is, but these are people who are insecure, who are frightened. Insecure as far as their job security is concerned in the age of globalization, digitalization, technological pro progress. Insecure because they see that in the financial crisis, a lot of their life savings were gambled away and then these institutions had to be bailed out by the state. They did not have any say in that. And in Germany particularly, by the influx, the inflow of over a million of refugees in the last two years. So it's very easy to exploit that if the elites, and by that I mean the first and political elites, are not explaining this and are not giving the very complex, difficult answers, because then other people will give easy answers, and these are the wrong answers, and this is exploited by the IFD, by Gerd Wilders in the Netherlands, Marine Le Pen in France, uh, in, in the uh, Farage uh, Brexit, if you ask people why they voted for Brexit, because they said, we want to be the master in our own house. We don't want foreigners coming in, we want our own uh, tribunals and our own law courts judge our uh, diff differences and we don't want to pay money to Brussels and not run our fate by faceless bureaucrats. Now, um, to what degree is German, has the German leadership, the Merkel government, the responsibility for what has happened? I think they have had a huge responsibility, and if you want to pinpoint it, I think it's mainly Angela Merkel. And I will tell you why. Great German chancellors, when they saw difficult strategic watersheds coming down the road, they had the guts, the foresight and the willingness to do things against public opinion and to work very, very hard to bring public opinion along. Adenauer with the Western integration. Willy Brandt with the Ostpolitik. Then you had Schmidt with the medium-range nuclear uh, missile gap against the so-called peace movement. Kohl with the common currency. Schröder with the Agenda 2010 labor reform. And since 2005, nothing. Now, it's very legitimate if a politician wants to be re-elected and he says, Ruhe is the erste Bürgerpflicht. Calm is the main, is the main thing. You know me. You give you a sleeping pill every night and don't bother me. Come back in four years' time. The downside is, if you don't see these things coming down the road, like for instance the refugee issues, we knew what was happening. We saw the UNHCR camps in Jordan, Turkey and Lebanon. We saw the television pictures on the Mediterranean. We knew that the southern uh, uh, countries couldn't co cope with this onslaught. If you wait too long, then you come to a situation where only bad options are left. Greece in 2010, no cent for the Greeks. The energy turnaround after Fukushima, without consulting anybody, internally, externally, she decreed the exit from the exit from the exit of nuclear energy. And then on the 5th of September 2015, when 3,000 3,000 refugees were stranded at the fence in Hungary. She said, you can do schaffen, anybody can come, and we cannot protect our borders anyway. And this was a very, very severe mistake, and she created single-handedly this party, because the old dictum of Franz Josef Strauss always was, we are doing well as CDU, CSU, if to the right of us there is no room for other parties. The right of us is the war. And in the knowledge and the certainty that that was the case, Angela Merkel took her party to the left, into SPD territory. Minimum wage, rollback of the agenda policy, uh, uh, the open door policy, energy uh, uh, turnaround, 
uh, etc. And that left some room on the right side, which is filled by the AfD. Now, where do we go from here? The Great Coalition, the Grand Coalition is a matter of the past because the only partner, SPD, who has seen that they have been asphyxiated by Angela Merkel over the years, said we go into opposition. And the only option open is the so-called Jamaica Coalition. The CDU-CSU, the business-friendly liberals, and the Greens. Now, these come from very different parts of the political spectrum. So many people say it will not work. But I have worked, as I told you, as a young man in the office of Helmut Schmidt. I ran the office of Genscher and Kinkel. And I have sat in many coalition negotiations any, no party program will survive the first round of coalition negotiations. It has a mundane reason, because they want power, but it also has a more philosophical and more important reason, that is, if they don't get their act together, we will come to new elections, and that is exactly the argument the right-wing populists were waiting for. So I'm very positive that we will get that.